I mean, Dan Holmes, Derek Schaefer, and I have been working a lot on uh, aspects of strongly progressive MPI. I've been actually a proponent of that for the last quarter century. Um, and this talk is a series of talks about why is MPI perceived to be so complex. So when Dan and Derek and I uh, worked on this paper, our goal is to show the conflation of the effects of strong progress, semantic terms, and all sorts of different cross-cutting questions in the MPI standard. Knowing who's in the audience, this clearly will elicit some feedback, and which is great. Uh, and uh, hopefully you'll get some value from seeing that uh, as we try to simplify things in the future, uh, there's the effect some of them cut in very surprisingly different ways. This talk is, of course, an invite to read our paper, which goes into great detail, uh, but of course, still limited in size and maybe a longer journal paper will allow us to elaborate some more. But as I said, what's not in the title, oops, let's see if I can actually advance, sorry, um, is that it's really part one which is does strong progress simplify MPI? And so we'll talk a little bit about the different areas and uh, hopefully I'll be able to fit most of this into the time remaining. The, the, if, you didn't, if you don't stay for the end uh, or we don't get to the end, we're gonna come back and say, if you actually were to get rid of weak progress, uh, all the hardware that we can conceive all the way back actually to the Cosmic Cube, which one of my mentors did at Caltech in 1981, could have done strong progress. So we don't see any hardware uh, it's a beautiful theory, but it leads to complexity. So in the end, we'll show you some opportunities that actually also would change what you might do with the semantic terms chapter and so on. So this, so Dan, especially as the lead author, deserves special credit, um, yeah, although he's not with us today, for really thinking through some of these questions as he's been thinking in a cross-cutting way. And as we work with him on uh, this, uh, we were really thinking about a few things, and then he brought up a number of other ones, including some very interesting demonstrations of how strong progress would simplify, uh, you know, everything, including down to implementations in certain cases. So see, a point in a number of questions, really in the fault tolerance area, we have the weakest results, uh, but we went through a dumb number of things that are both in terms of development and standardization, as well as use of MPI. Uh, and I hope you all read the paper, which is after, actually why we're giving the talk. So what's our position? We know that strong progress is optional. We all think we know what that means. The messages move independent of how often you call MPI after you've started uh, the sends and the receives or the collectives. And uh, our, our approach is that we really think that it's gonna simplify the semantic logic of MPI and or it improves the opportunity for more performance portability being high quality MPI implementation and or it aids reasoning about errors and faults in MPI programs. On the latter, we're finding the least so far, although we have some uh, uh, so a fine discussion in the paper about potential changes in the semantic terms that are being offered that may actually make false tolerance harder to understand. Uh, so, you know, as I said in a, a moment ago, we haven't found really any hardware people have run on that couldn't have provided strong progress in the last, uh, I'd say all the way back to 1981. So that's nearly 40 years in the systems that we've worked on or imagine whether it's a cluster or a multi-computer like the Cosmic Cube or a Cray or what have you. Um, so uh, all of this theory has bought complexity and we also want to say is going with natural language specifications uh, really has had a long uh, impact on both specificity and clarity. And we've spent almost two years, I think, I was sitting with some of the people at Golf and, and others um, um, who are in the, on the uh, Claudia, who are on the call and others uh, for years, uh, more or less on the questions of how to clarify the semantic terms because they're so complicated in, in natural language versus uh, predicate calculus. And that's just another point we're bringing out hopefully we'll uh, be able to drive that home uh, in future aspects of the standard. So we're sort of basically, forgive us, we you know, this essentially basically is a critique, but it's also so shows uh, structurally what our opportunities. And I think interestingly, the strong progress links closely in this particular case, potentials for simplification. Okay, so uh, some principles, and we're basically also making some suggestions if you read the paper on semantic changes. Well, you know, it has to be clear to programs what is required to write correct programs uh, to program uh, to programmers, I should say. It's clear to implementers what is required to write correct library, and uh, it should be clear to both what's good for good uh, what's required for good performance and and for error handling. And these kinds of things underlie our paper, and sort of uh, bringing forth these kinds of principles, which also should uh, would be guide further standardization. Uh, and you know, again, since this is it's about the strong progress making better and. Uh, putting a taxonomy, a, a deeper taxonomy of uh, uh, strong versus weak progress is given in the paper. And I just share for example, you're very familiar with cooperative, which is what, you know, uh, the libraries way back to MPICH uh, we were doing in the early 1990s. 
and then strong progress uh, uh, have offered in other uh, implementations of MPI. And there are various flavors of uh, strong progress that depends whether you use hardware offload or dedicated or shared resources and so forth, um, which we talk about. And those have uh, implications of really understanding what we mean and defining those kinds of progress. But I think that's pretty clear and I'll, I'll go on and invite you to dive deeper into our paper if you wanna see details on that. Um, so basically, one of the first questions is, um, uh, does strong sim progress simplify the specification? And we're going to argue that in this, and we do argue quite a bit in this paper that it it does simplify things. And uh, and for a future MPI, and I also I, I use the same terminology with the same uh, intent as the prior speaker that future MPI means the MPI where we can agree maybe not to be backward compatible. So um, um, strong progress is more restrictive in some sense. It also simplifies things. Great efforts gone to, and by the way, those of us who are on the forum, which many of you are who are on the call, realize that since you only have Miller's Law and you can only keep seven plus minus two things in your head, we keep forgetting when we swap out about that the weak progress, what it really means, and strong progress is very clear and simpler. Of course, it's more restrictive. Um, the language itself and the standard is extremely complicated, and uh, we often need to call Bill Groff to remind us exactly what's okay because of uh, the complexity of the language. The, the obscurity of weak progress and so forth. And, uh, you know, certainly we're finding in this paper that we could make MPI less complex by having a formal language that expresses the semantics rather than the natural language, no matter how hard we try. Um, so here's some specific semantic terms. Um, we're, we're, we're going a little bit um, in the direction of saying strong progress plus modify the semantic terms. And this is different from, and Rolf and Cloudy and several others, uh, uh, Julian and others have worked Heavily, Puri, uh, he's on, worked heavily on the semantic terms for years, and I was in and out of that group in some of your papers. Um, we really think a strong local and weak local is coming in a new way uh, in, in, the, um, in the world where there's strong progress. And again, this is overlaps with the work of the semantic terms chapter and other papers, but we just basically brought it out again. Uh, so basically, we're interested in things being as strong local as possible, understanding uh, these terms. Again, our terms don't necessarily agree with what's going into MPI 4 or, in fact, what we would like to put in MPI 4 plus from the semantic terms agreement. But may, basically, what we're saying is we're trying to give you, have great clarity, and the clarity can be improved and MPI can be simplified if we're, uh, we're sticking with strong progress. So in one sense, we'd like to take the MPI standard version 4.0 and make what it called the uh, Rebels or Rogue Edition. Uh, in which case we say, you know, sort of in red letters, okay, strong progress, all the things that simplify out. And, you know, with consensus of the group, we could do that, um, essentially provide you with MPI slash four slash uh, SP, strong progress MPI. And you could see that that is a, as a kind of a profile of the specification is something people might want to standardize, implement, and specify one of our by, uh, large machines. It, I think certainly could help us with our future next 25 years. Um, so, you know, explicitly, uh, here's some options, for example, and I just want to make sure I go down. The point is, is these are just basic terms. They're not necessarily exactly like what's going into the semantic terms modifications, but if we explicitly require st strong progress and we can, we can, one approach is that we can explicitly ex uh, require strong progress and prohibit weak progress or uh, better yet allow users to choose the mechanism that they'll use in per, per communicator uh, would be uh, our preference for that. Uh, so, in other words, per communication space. Because of the way weak progress works, uh, even though communicators, we defined them originally as independent, uh, ultimately they're not independent because every uh, communicator has to guarantee weak progress of every, uh, every other communicator. Um, we would certainly deprecate all the send modes except synchronous. Uh, one of basically examples showing performance and error handling uh, uh, per, uh, issues and, and pitfalls in both collective and one-sided. So we have some recommendations. These are meant to be out there and avant-garde or out there pushing the discussion in this paper. So if you don't agree with them, great. Read the paper itself versus this, you know, press of the paper and and please come back to Dan and Derek and me with your with your thoughts. We'd like to have that argument and discussion. So um, we think that strong progress would simplify MPI because of the decoupling effect on the execution. And as you know, many MPI functions in, in, in uh, weak progress implementations have multimodal performance, which is a pain. And um, however, we also found obviously when we're implementing Overlapping strategies uh, with uh, either strong or weak progress. It's more complex than non overlapping strategies. The one advantage is that uh, when you have overlapping with strong progress, you don't have to put in those so called MPI test 
uh, games in order to uh, try to, uh, I would say, coax the MPI implementation to progress for you and then uh, give some kind of semblance of overlap. Uh, so predictability is certainly something which is important at Exascale and can strongly be improved because things that are strong local can't be multimodal anymore, and, but uh, weak local things, depending on some operation in another process, can still be multimodal. Multimodality is a, a bane to um, uh, getting your full um, to getting your full predictability. Sorry, to predictability and that and limit scalability and so on. So there's certainly uh, a value having these very sharp semantic terms with strong progress would certainly simplify um, aspects of uh, writing performance portable programs. And we also think uh, the predictability, as we know from real time systems, can help with overlap and, and load balance issues too. So it's certainly um, as we're thinking of this, if you want to call it again this SP mode. Um, for MPI 4, it has some clear advantages versus only giving up a theoretical uh, definition from 1993. Um, so, you know, um, what impacts on testing? So, strong progress can help eliminate bugs uh, with regard to this DevOps issues. A positive testing, um, you know, can test things with greater predictability because. In fact, you're relying on a very complex interplay of cooperative threads with the user program whenever you're testing, or even the test suite whenever you're testing uh, with weak progress. Uh, and you know, negative testing, maybe it's not better, but maybe things will at least fail as fast or faster. So for positive testing, we see some opportunity. Negative testing, looking for things that should fail, we don't see a lot. Um, uh, however, for non-execution-based testing, which as you know, is very important, let's say for app developers, one of the aspects of of real testing is, is uh, NB, uh, uh, non execution based texting and. Uh, and uh, that, you know, as you're understanding, you're not coding around weak progress. Uh, there's some whole suite of papers that I've you know, commented on before that talk about how you insert your MPI tests. Everywhere to try to drive that that's clearly not very performance portable. So we think, yes, it helps with uh, having uh, supply. We can simplify MPI in effect with um, with strong progress. And uh, we can uh, uh, speak to issues of better performance and, and scalability, uh, but it's not really going to help you a lot with correctness. Um, it's just a little bit, maybe. Well, basically, I think the answer is no. Then, so some example, and I think this should really hit home because we're in a multi-language effort. As weak progress actually is uh, perhaps this is the most damning aspect of keeping this theoretical promise from so long ago, is that. Um, there are whole classes of very reasonable programs and certainly ones that are multi uh, language programs, whether you combine, let's say, um, different parallel models that don't work with weak progress, which are perfectly reasonable with uh, strong progress. So in the end, where application programmers de demand uh, that we allow them to compose programs, both from multiple, perhaps this is in fact inevitable, strong progress is required, otherwise the um, the assumption of user thread progress in one MPI application and however progress is made in another. In this example, we're showing something with interrupt driven. Uh, we show that basically this program only works uh, with strong progress. And in fact, it is deemed to be an illegal program or sorry, an erroneous program in MPI. And uh, it's perfectly like logical that users will demand this. Now, there's a lot of work done on how to unify the uh, cooperative or uh, preemptive threading underneath multiple parallel models. But that requires a multi, uh, the composability to depend on implementers, either all doing the models together and therefore providing a common guarantee of resource and progress, or it requires uh, luck. So I'd say in terms of getting things to uh, to automatically work right, not necessarily with the optimal performance, but to work correctly, uh, a weak progress is going to be a, a, a dead albatross around our neck uh, moving forward and it certainly adds to the complexity. And now we can see certain classes of very reasonable programs, especially like the one shown here and many others potentially that you just can't do. So composability with multiple program models is now something we're gonna have to face and, uh, and weak progress uh, as to the complexity of that uh, specification and how we would even make a treaty with other parallel programming models for, uh, for interspersing the models into an application. At one level, this might be uh, seem obvious at multiple levels, it seems really gruelingly difficult to understand how to um, Build the program with some MPI at some levels, some asynchronous other things at other levels, and not have deadlocks. Uh, strong progress, simplify fault tolerance. There's really no evidence of what we studied so far. There are a few uh, comments in the paper, however, about this question about um, does new semantic terms go in a direction that make things worse? And you can read the paper, and we have some kind of comments about maybe we need to be very careful about what guarantees various semantic term choices are giving for fault tolerance. But no, we didn't see any particular benefit. 
at, as of uh, the study on uh, that strong progress helps with simplifying the MPI with regard to fault tolerance. Um, so is weak progress necessary? If you didn't get my drift so far, the three of us are convinced that the answer is no. Must it be by default? Uh, and, uh, not necessary. Can strong progress and weak progress coexist? Absolutely. And that's an, if we were to build, uh, we're actually building, uh, you know, a new MPI libraries that actually have per communicator uh, progress rules and allow you to um, do things even that, you know, ex extremely weak progress intentionally for some, uh, some threats for predictability also. Uh, so, yes, they can coexist. It's kind of uh, leaning back into this quality of service things we looked at 20 years ago with MPIRT, trying to require properties of the underlying transport uh, per communicator uh, means that you could you could have these. And, um, uh, and again, there are classes of, uh, of areas where polling progress makes sense. For example, you want to, in a uh, program with lots of short messages, you certainly would like to have polling completion notification and but strong message progress. So the, the mention of completion notification is not covered in this in this uh, uh, paper at all. So, okay, so something, this is hopefully, and if you get the downloaded the version, that's uh, hopefully online. Uh, this is this slide's not in there, but I just leave for you and, I, and I'm, I'm gonna run out of time soon. So let me be careful. Um, you know, um, we're trying to do things that involve persistence now. We have an MPI for, of course, uh, persistent collectives. And we're putting in partition uh, sends and receives also, which are effectively the first time we have uh, a Slack uh, sort of ch channels in MPI, even though they're they're motivated by um, concurrent filling and unfilling of buffers, and and of course GPU and load. Um, those things are limited because of weak progress. Um, in some sense, we've taken dis different decisions between partitioned and uh, persistent collective. In the persistent collective, uh, we ultimately chose to let NS be blocking. Which means non-local and synchronizing. It means they don't have to return till they're good and ready. Um, they can, but they don't have to. So they can actually uh, make decisions if they want to before they give control back to the user thread. Um, but P send and P receive init are, in fact, benighted in some sense by the fact that the first time that the init functions might communicate could be in the first MPI await. This is something Jim Dine and, and, and Ryan Grant. I know at least Ryan's on the call. Um, we have been bringing out and reminding me from time to time that as we're specifying these things, we can't rely on the fact that any sort of negotiation actually happens between the endpoints of the channel on the first wait. And this is, of course, inimical to our goal of having early binding actually be early binding. Uh, again, so this is the kind of thing that the two areas, new areas that uh, we put in have made somewhat different decisions. And admittedly, there are other problematic issues with non-blocking in it for persistent that come from the language interfaces that Ralph and Martin, Ralph, uh, oh, you know who Ralph is, and Martin Schultz have brought up, and so we've stayed away from those, but those are mostly actually, some of those other concerns with the non-blocking and it's are actually driven by language implementation, uh, language specification, it's rather than by the semantics of the operations themselves. So basically these operations involving in it uh, can be much more interesting under strong progress. And uh, that's just something I'll put out there as a sort of a thing we're going to look at some more. So. Uh, we're certainly uh, limited because of weak progress with regard to specification. And that, there may be other areas of specification. I'm not an expert on the one-sided chapter. They're coming from weak progress. So some things, again, I'm sorry I spoke a lot faster than I would have, but <laughs> I'm still in the time. So uh, hopefully there's a comments. I'm sure there'll be some comments and questions. So we find, and this is, I think, we've known this. I think uh, Ron Brightwell and I have been arguing about this on the same side of the argument for 20 plus years, that strong progress has clear and material positive impacts on applications, implementations, and their software engineering, not all equally, but uh, you know, predictability at scales of millions of processors is going to make matter a lot. And that, of course, is, uh, it also has a cut, cross-cutting effect with the semantic terms exercise, which is extremely complicated by weak progress in some aspects. So there, some benefits can only be achieved by disallowing weak progress. It's certainly something that you could require when you buy a large supercomputer. Say, I require a strong progress implementation. There it would be nice for the form to actually say, here are the semantic simplifications for a strong progress profile of the standard. Uh, you can get these additional guarantees and benefits. And in some sense, it might just help for the um, deprecation of weak progress in the next decade. Uh, class of quick program and compositions of models um, grow under strong progress. And it certainly as we think about everything being multi-language, whether it's MPI plus X or MPI plus X plus Y. And in fact, you don't want to crack open someone's third party library every time you want to see if you're going to deadlock. So it's an important uh, aspect to be studied more. Uh, the areas of specification limits, such as what we're doing with inits and persistence and early binding, 
uh, need further attention because weak progress, in fact, uh, has a has an impact there. So please read our paper. After all, that's why we're giving the talk. There's some very interesting work in the paper on showing how, um, with strong local and strong progress, how things simplify. And uh, you know, again, to our first author, Dan. Uh, has done extremely good work on that aspect of the paper to really show you what the benefits are and getting away from a complex cooperative progress engines and MPI implementations are really important. And I think you all know that if you looked at the cooperative progress engines of certain MPI implementations, they're necessary, very complicated because they work so hard to avoid internal concurrency. And uh, that, that's just um, a legacy we should get rid of. So part two, there's a part two, after all, this is part one. We'll continue the theme of MPI complexity with other aspects of MPI. And, and I would just say, you know, what might be in part two, this is just a you know, teaser that I added. I figured I might have a little extra time. Well, I still do. You know, uh, we'd like to uh, not only, you know, argue that strong progress would lead to a simpler MPI and you know, uh, uh, for, uh, predicate calculus would lead to a more precise MPI, but also there are whole things that should be thrown out and redone. And, and the previous speaker, uh, Jesper has certainly said he'd like to make things better by respecifying, and, and I think that's naturally a good thing to do. But data types are an example of something that's are pretty awful, and um, and uh, because of that, we really have to ask ourselves uh, why can't we do it better, and in ways that actually would lead to um, you know efficiency. And Jesper, by the way, has a series of papers on how to make uh, how to understand data type performance too, is to give credit to him and his students. So MPI has many language type data types. There are so many types that are implicitly there. We don't actually, we cope with that in semantic terms just a little bit. There's a whole orthogonal study yet to be done about the fact that uh, the types, um, Martin Rufinock, who's at still PCC, is a leader on this. And uh, essentially when you explicitly describe all the types, not just that something's contained in an integer or account or so on, but really what their semantics are, you'll find out that there's a lot of complexity in MPI coming from this. And sometimes it's confusing as heck, uh, and, uh, and this could be an area where we could simplify just by making explicit what those data, those types are, what type system rules there are, and when we add new features to the standards, if we're adding new types. Um, so, you know, MPI appears to be from a function point. Does it build beta build profiles uh, to allow for optimization focus? We've done some studies again. Martin Ignacio, uh, who's I believe Laguna, who is uh, uh, on the call also. I've uh, done some studies to say that a lot of programs use so little of MPI that uh, there'd be some advantages also to not only say, for example, a strong progress profile of the whole thing, but really focus on, so let's say, some um, domain specific profiles to allow people who want more performance and less complexity to get that. That's been forbidden by standard uh, dogma since the beginning, by the way. Um, I, we've asked for it before. That was not a popular idea because we were afraid, I think, in the beginning that people would only implement subsets and we wouldn't get performance portability. Uh, the community has voted, however, and lots of functions are never used. And this is an, means there's another opportunity to focus performance on the parts that are used. So asynchronous notification and the mechanisms could come up in our future paper. We're looking for ways to compose multiple languages as well as to get more scalability. So if you think about triggering, interrupt-driven, asynchronous notification, these are also forbidden in MPI and they impact both the main programming, they also impact fault tolerance notification if you wanna get external information and they have impacts on what you can do in the tools chapter. So the MPI is pretty complicated because there's no asynchronous notification in certain places. It uh, could be very interesting. And again, from our point of view, how do we, why is MPI perceived to be so complex? This is another area where perhaps something that looks like new functionality would actually do us a great service, especially because requests are an old and very uh, weakly typed concept, and they, uh, and you know, wait all is a very linear concept, and so on. So, um, you know, okay, um, there could be other aspects too. We're going to study them. This is just basically a advert for the future, but we already see that this was only supposed to be part one, and it's supposed to not be like history of the world from Mel Brooks that there only is a part one. Uh, there will be a part two. Hopefully, maybe next year in this this uh, this forum. Great. So, thank you for your attention, and I want to make sure we give credit to our first author, Dan, who's uh, I don't believe I'm on the Zoom today, uh, from EPCC and Epigram HG, and we're, we're supported by uh, uh, Sandia and Livermore, and by uh, and NNSA directly, as well as the National Science Foundation. So, thank you very much. All right, thanks, Tony, for the presentation. So uh, it's uh, right at the top of the hour here, but maybe we can take one uh, quick question, either from, um, oh, I see Ralph is uh, raising his hand again. I think this is a different hand raised than last time, so I'm uh, uh, promoting the panelist again. 
and unmute. And uh, Rolf, go ahead. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, I don't see uh, why the uh, where our MPI users are, have guys uh, rule. Uh, normally, uh, a user need to care about. And the only area where I know where is there is a, a difference uh, directly visible is for lock, but for functions uh, I I don't see. And, uh, and we have seen in the MPI form that nobody in the MPI form really of uh, local is strong or weak local, and therefore I I I don't see where we have a problem. Uh, with uh, that we have weak local definition. Yeah. No, I'm not sure I'm answering your question. Oh, yeah. No. So, uh, Ralph, uh, the, the dichotomy between the old and the new, I think that lots of people will care about overlapping working and predictability. And the forum is not, is not peopled with a lot of people who develop applications, but rather by people who specify MPI. So, again, I think the, uh, the, um, the future is uh, uh, is uh, complicated by the fact that we have to go back to these abstruse arguments because of weak progress when we specify MPI. You could read the paper and come back to us. I think that would be beneficial because you can see we've made some pretty careful arguments, and I think that would be beneficial to look at that. But what the forum cares about versus what are good applications are clearly a divergent anyway because we have 400 and something functions, and we find hundreds of MPI applications that use tiny fractions and don't even do anything in uh, whole chapters of the of the standard uh, over the last, you know 10 or 15 years so i think you have to be very careful to argue that no one in the it's sort of like a false cause argument to say no one in the comes to the standard body cares about strong local weak local what we actually care about is the application performance portability scalability and predictability so when you're looking at building things for exascale certainly the outcome uh with a strong progress mpi is, is cool, it's better in general, and when you have long messages. And on top of that, um, you know, someone could want to specify, see how simpler you could make MPI if you put that all the way through the standard. That's that's the argument of our paper. We don't have to agree. I, I knew you would be here, so I was expecting you to say that. No, no, it's good. It, it's good that we should just read the paper. Uh, yes, uh, my problem is to see where are the source <laughs> But the users have really to care about that the local is a weak local. And the examples that we have are such strange things like like um, the MPI cancel and so on. But in normal application, you never need to care about. Uh, you may have different. This is only a question of the MPI library. This means each MPI library has the right to do strong local, uh, to do strong progress. Uh, that's not forbidden. And, yeah, but you, uh, have a program that you can't know that when you write the program, knowing that you're going to get the certain property. Let's say, for example, we could have an MPI in it with strong progress, knowing that that property, a kind of quality of service is guaranteed, allows you to write a very different program than not knowing that. So if you care about performance predictability, uh, portability, it's great that we've implemented, we have a commercial MPI called Champion Pro or MPI Pro for 20 years ago that does strong progress and, uh, and and blocking notification. And it was doing extremely well on multi-computers in the, in the uh, uh, early ASCII program, for example. And it, it, is, it is far superior to one in terms of getting time to solution down for applications. So we know it can be implemented. We can know it can be widely used and it benefits applications. The question is, does not guaranteeing it hamper what applications are written? The answer is yes, because there's no way to say I require strong progress on this communicator, or I don't want to run, or I want to change how I write my program, knowing and adapting to strong progress versus mm -hmm. weak progress on the particular system. So it is true that if there were a way to require a QoS for it, you would write different programs. So yeah, it does actually, I think it does impact uh, the fact that it's permissible, but you can't even ask for it. You can ask for thread multiple, but you can't ask for strong progress, for example. So I think that does change a program. So you have to write for the worst case, which is weak progress, in order okay. to write a real library, in order to write a application. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, it leaves performance, portability, and predictability on the table. I'm pretty sure of that. Okay. 
I expect I find an example in your paper. Oh, thank you. And of course, you know, we're always going to debate. So we're all friends here. <laughs>